Welcome to Bitcoin Stuff. Well, I managed to get an interview with Amari Seche of uh, Bitcoin ABC, and he agreed to talk to me a little bit about Bitcoin Cash on my show. And uh, I know people are going to accuse me of giving him a softball interview, but unfortunately we just got along too well for me to be objective with him but uh, there, I'm going to add some commentary to the end to tell you what I think I know after this interview and um, I would like you to consider doing a, a compare and contrast with my discussions with uh, JW Weatherman the Bitcoin core cult member just to take a look at the the differences between these two people and I've included the uh, the videos below and uh, you'll also notice that Amari asks me a question in this interview which I'm going to answer after the interview is over so stay tuned and I hope you enjoy my discussion with Amari Seche of, Bit of Bitcoin ABC so I was wondering if you could begin by talking about your version of the history of the scaling debate. So the history of Bitcoin starting uh, a few years ago and what led up to Bitcoin Cash. Yes. Um, so I've been in Bitcoin for a fairly long time. And for most of that time, it seems obvious for most people or at least when you were reading the forum and reddits and stuff like that, it seemed obvious for, for most people that at some point you got to raise a block size when, you know, when the times come and when there is enough usage on the network. Um, this seems to have changed in 2015 or so, where a part of the community started being vocal about not doing that. Um, and, um, and then it started degenerating when essentially various, uh, you know, various place people were using to talk started being censored uh, in the name of if you want to change the rule, then this is not Bitcoin, this is an altcoin now. And so you cannot discuss that here. Uh, so that happened on Reddit and Bitcoin Talk and a few other places. And so what happened quite often is that when people cannot discuss anymore, then conflicts tend to escalate. And this is exactly what ended up happening. Uh, though because conflict is very costly, I was expecting it to not last as long as it did. But it seems clear to me in 2017 that the conflict were not coming to a resolution. And also, the compromise solution that was segwit to x at the time, um, you know, seemed very much like a bait and switch because it was activating part of the proposal that, you know, one part of the community wanted, which is segwit, and the other part that is bigger block a few months later. And so that gave a big opportunity for a bait and switch. So I was not feeling good about this. And as it turned out, I was right. So I decided to go ahead and, and you know, make an alternative. Uh, okay, so you're, you're saying that it was difficult to have a, an open debate about how, how scaling should work. And, and that was kind mm -hmm. of the, how, how, how the problem began, according to you. Yeah, it's where it begins to escalate. And, and so uh, if, if you want to, to change the rules of Bitcoin, that is, that is an altcoin. That is, that is the argument that you, you heard from, from people. And that is, that is the excuse for, for not uh, being able to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. Essentially, people uh, starting to say, like, if you want to change the rule, then this is not Bitcoin anymore. And so your discussion is off topic here. You should go talk to, about that somewhere else. That's, yeah, I, I think that there's an interesting definition of consensus as far as the, the rules of Bitcoin goes. Yeah, it's like, if you don't agree with me, 
then go somewhere else. And so we are all in consensus. <laughs> you shouldn't you shouldn't break consensus. <laughs> it's kind of a ridiculous idea of what a consensus is if you're not supposed to break it. Uh because to me it doesn't count as a consensus if you can't disagree. Well, if you exclude all the people that disagree, then you are in consensus 100% of the time. Uh, yeah. It's a very effective way to come to a consensus, actually. Um, OK, if, if so that's the only objective, right? Uh, not because it came to the best consensus, but uh, it converged very efficiently. Yeah, well, uh, I, I, so I, I would certainly like to To see more uh, the the recognition that uh, there's there's it is it is self defeating to uh, exclude people from being part of the conversation if they have bitcoins because uh, to me if you if you have bitcoins that means that you are part of the market you're going to ultimately be one of the people making making the final decision. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, now when when we met before, you you told me about um, some of your your philosophy for for what what made you decide to to go off on your own and uh, break the rules. So uh, can you talk about that a little bit? Um, I'm actually not sure what you're referring to, but um, essentially, if you cannot come to the consensus, then then you have to. Everybody needs to go their own way, right? Like when people don't agree, it becomes very costly to stay together. Uh, kind of like a, a couple that don't love each other anymore. You know, that's gonna spend all that time fighting. They're better off uh, separating and going their own way, right? And um, and this is very much what happened, what we saw happen, because after the fork, then each branch of the fork was able to work on realizing their vision, whereas before the situation was very much gridlocked. And we saw the value of both branch increase over time, right? So um, I think there was a lot of positive that came out of that. Uh, sure. So. Um... Well, let's talk about a why. Why? Let's talk about the the vision. The vision for for scaling Bitcoin. Um, tell me about uh, the the vision. The vision that that you wanted to follow with uh, mm -hmm. with Bitcoin Cash. And tell me about the the vision that you you didn't want to follow. Okay, so. The, the most important aspect of Bitcoin, in my opinion, is the money property of it. It's um, as long as those money property are convert, uh, you know, conserved. This is one of the best money, probably the best money technology that's been created. Um, but uh, scaling it is, is somewhat of a challenge. It's, it's not that easy on the technical level. And what a part of the community decided to do is because there are some technical challenges, then uh, we should sacrifice part of the monetary property of Bitcoin. So this is what happened on the, the Bitcoin core side of, of, of the chain, right? They prefer keeping the block small so they avoid having some scaling issues. But at the same time, it makes the, the monetary property worse, right? Because the confirmation time becomes unreliable and the transaction fee becomes higher when you do that. And I think this is a self-defeating strategy in the sense that um, you are you are destroying what you're trying to preserve, right? Uh, if you choose that strategy, it's like there are risks in that direction, so we're not gonna go there because um, because there is risk, and we prefer you know actually destroying what we have, which seems um, uh, like a very very bad option. So, so right now, what we've been doing in Bitcoin Cash is uh, mostly increase the block size, and we've fixed 
a few other issues that are very much technical, but that come alongside with that. Um, because a lot of people have in mind that you just increase the block size and everything works, you know, just kind of like that. But there is actually a lot of um, a lot of optimization work that needs to be done for that to work properly. And can uh, you can you tell me a little bit about that? It's okay to go into uh, some some details if you want. Okay. Um, well, I, I can give a few examples, but uh, more generally, this is difficult to cover them all, right? It's more like a death by thousand cuts kind of problem than a, than a problem where there are a few big stuff that you need to solve. But um, generally, um, so there was this problem with quadratic hashing uh, on Bitcoin since the beginning, where uh, I'm, I'm a bit simplifying here, but essentially the bigger a transaction becomes and the more expensive it becomes to validate, in a way that is quadratic. That means that a transaction that is twice as big is four times harder to validate. And a transaction that is three times as big is nine times as hard to validate and so on. Now, can you explain why that is? Because it seems like there should be, you should check one signature per input. Uh, yes. Um, so why that is, is because as part of the signature checking, you want to do a checksum of the transaction so that a signature that is on one transaction is going to be invalid on another transaction. And the way this checksum is computed uh, depends on the whole transaction. So if the transaction is bigger, it's more expensive to compute. And it's different for each input in like the, the traditional way of doing it. Right, because you have to remove the signature script in order to yeah, check Yeah, essentially you need to tweak specifically the input that you are validating, but not the other input. And uh, there is a, it's, it's, the whole process is quite complicated, but essentially you need to rehash the whole transaction in a slightly different way for every input. Right. Okay, and you fix that? Um, yeah, so... There is, there is a solution that I've been made in SegWit, uh, named uh, B143, if I remember properly, that, that address that. But because SegWit is a soft fork, it doesn't really address the problem, right? It's just like you have this door on your house that is not secure, right? And you install a second door on the side that is more secure, then you have not increased the security of your house. You know what I mean? So this problem is fixed with SegWit for a, um, um, like a subset of the transaction, but not in general. And so we decided to apply a solution that is very similar to what is done in SegWit, but for all the transaction. And we could do that. Um, that's, that's a hard fork, right? So we could do that as a hard fork. So that's one of the stuff that we fix to make sure that people don't start producing blocks that are absolutely expensive to validate that would, you know, Bug the network down. That that's you know one of the one of the thing that was done. Um, there are a few others. Um, one other that come to mind that was done more recently is that um, I don't know if you're familiar with the compact block protocol, but this is a protocol that allow nodes to transmit blocks to each other faster than just transmitting the block, and it rely on the fact that uh, the node are going to have in their mempool most of the transactions that are going to be in, in the block that is found already, right? Most yeah, that, of the that's time. that's the one that uses uh, Bloom filters, right? Uh, Bloom filter is Xin. Compact block is another technology, but that is, um, you know, the, the technicalities are different, but the, the, you know, high level approach is kind of the same. It's taking advantage that the node on the other side knows a lot of stuff already to be able to transmit the block faster. Yeah. OK. And within that protocol, it was designed in such a way that uh, it doesn't support more than uh, 65,000 transactions for free per block. And uh, this is not a problem for one megabyte block, because you cannot stuff that much transaction in a one megabyte block. But as the block goes bigger, um, you end up being able to do that. So you need to tweak the implementation of that protocol so that it works with larger number of transactions. That's, that's another example of, of things that needed to be done um, for things to work. So there is, um, 
there is a lot of small stuff like that that you need to take care of as you grow the as you grow the block size. That's also answer some people are asking, you know, what why not removing the block size altogether? Well, because there is all those problems, right? If you remove the block size altogether, a, a ton of stuff are gonna break. So you need to, you know, push it, fix the stuff that don't work at that side, and then push it again, you know. Uh, and so on. So okay. it's a it's a difficult challenge, but it's worth doing, in my opinion. Okay, well, let's go back to the the monetary properties of Bitcoin because I thought um, your your answer there was was interesting. So one one thing that really struck me about the, the scaling debate is sort of how uh, how how divorced it was from the the value of Bitcoin, and to me, it it feels like. Uh, like like increasing the the value of bitcoin is uh is not and uh, not the the overriding concern in terms of uh i should say not not always the overriding concern in terms of bitcoin development because to me like um if there are potential problems with increasing the, the bandwidth of Bitcoin, these all have to be uh, balanced against the uh, the 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 potential increase in in the value of Bitcoin mm -hmm. that they would you know that would be enabled. Yeah. And to me, that is that is not how 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 the debate has has been going. What what do you what do you think of that? At least not not until Bitcoin Cash came out. Yeah, I, th I think there is a lot of that. Um, also, lately, the price has been very much driven by various hype cycles more than by fundamentals, right? So we saw various fundamentals of Bitcoin getting worse. There is actually less merchant adoption this year than there was a year ago, for instance. Um, the, the market dominance is also lower, but still the price raised quite a bit. So I, I think you know we are in the phase of the market where there is a lot of newcomers that you know don't know the space very well but are learning. So the kind of like the communal brain of everybody in the market trading and stuff is um, is still like a baby brain right now and and kind of learning. So the value is is hard to um, it's hard to assert that way on short time scale, but. On longer time scale, we see that it's very clear that um, if the usage of Bitcoin is better than the usage increase and the value increase, um, there is um, there is actually a very nice graph um, that shows that essentially the value of Bitcoin is very tightly correlated with the number of transactions that are processed by the network until you know last year or so where the two measures start to decorate completely but for most of bitcoin history the value was um very much driven by the usage of people and so um it seems like it also seems intuitive that as the usage grow and more people grow it, the demand increase and the price increase right so this is um this is more of the, the long term view of the stuff. And with the price increasing, it also gives you more resources to fix the problem that come with that. Um, yeah, so yeah, if the price increase, that means company in the space and all of that have that more resources. And so they can pay engineer to fix the scaling issue and work on those stuff, right? It's, it's, it's pushing the envelope to get the resources that you need to increase the size of the envelope, kind of. Okay, well, uh... Well, I, I am just glad that the the Bitcoin investors have uh, more 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 options about uh, the future the future of Bitcoin now, because uh, to me that is that is the only that is the only definition of consensus that actually makes sense is if the uh, the investors are able to to come to a, an agreement. On, on something and uh 
I, I don't think that uh, there was a, there was an, there was a, a way for that to happen until, uh, until Bitcoin Cash came out. Well, so right now there is an option to trade between the two vision, right? And right. So and that's people uh, that make the right trade are going to end up richer, and people that make the wrong trade are going to become poorer on the long term. And so, the people that make the right call, they are poor, and influence within the system is going to increase. And the one that make poor choices right now, they're poor, and influence within the system is going to decrease, right? So it's it's good for the system in the long run. Well, uh, yes. Well, one one of the things that I that I heard when uh, when I was talking talking about this with with people is that conflict is is inefficient because people are are working at uh, cross purposes to one another. Mm -hmm. So it's it's bad to uh, to to start a conflict. But uh, but it, conflict it, is inefficient. That's true. That's true. Conflict is inefficient, but it's not always more inefficient than the alternative. No, I, I agree. Right? So it, if people can come to an agreement more efficiently than by having a conflict, then sure, like you got to do that because it's um, it's cheaper. But if the conflict has been dragging for two years, then you know that the alternative is not very efficient either. So. Uh, yeah, and well, that that goes back to to what you said earlier about uh, having 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 trouble getting uh, getting your ideas heard in in debate. So, um, okay, so you were you were talking about value a little bit. So, uh, why don't you talk some more about why? Uh, why how 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 should bitcoin cash fit in a an investor's portfolio or why 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 what what will convince an investor that uh he should get uh more more of it assuming that you you want to do that cuz maybe you're just going to uh say it's an experiment and you're you're at your own risk that would that would be an acceptable answer. So uh, both both are true. Like those are not mutually exclusive. Um, uh, yeah. One quick parenthesis on that: a lot of people have been asking me, you know, like should I increase my portion of Bitcoin Cash or should I sell my Bitcoin Core for Bitcoin Cash or vice versa, or whatever. And usually, what I've been answering to people is that if they are asking me the question, then they probably want to keep a bit of both. Uh, because they are not, you know, they are not the most knowledgeable in the space if they feel the need to ask that. And so they probably want to be aged a bit. So I would say first, like you go more one way or another once you get a bit of a sense of what the people on which side are trying to do and, and what you made your mind about, you know, is it a good idea or a bad idea? Um, that being said, I think that Bitcoin Cash has a lot more potential upside than Bitcoin Core. Um, in the sense that Bitcoin Core now is just trying to be digital gold, essentially. Uh, and Bitcoin Cash is trying to be money. And so when you look at the market cap of gold and the market cap, say the, the M1 of like pretty much any currency, it's significantly bigger than gold by at least one order of magnitude, right? So you're looking at a potential upside that is significantly higher. Uh, you are looking at the rice, risk profile that is probably a bit higher as well, right? So, you know, you want to equilibrate that in some way. Um, the thing is where, where I think Bitcoin Cash makes a lot of more sense is that the truly groundbreaking, you know, like the breakthrough that was done with Bitcoin to begin with is that we have two forms of money mainly used. Um, during human history, well, we had like many, many, but two big ones that you know kind of uh, are recurring over centuries, uh, and those are going to be precious metal like gold and silver, and those have very good scarcity property. They are fungible. Uh, they are, you know, they have all kind of very good monetary property, but they are not very convenient to use on a day-to-day -day basis, right? 
And on the other end, you have fiat money that is significantly more convenient to use on a day to day basis, but that don't have the same uh, scarcity property that precious metal have. And the, the breakthrough that Bitcoin succeeded at making is to create a technology that both has the strong monetary property of uh, precious metal, but that is so very convenient to use. Right? I think this is where the breakthrough is, because during all human history, you have plenty of civilization um, that are all different, but the, the history of money within those civilization is kind of the same. Uh, at the beginning, you have people using precious metal for a while. It's a convenient, but they don't have like, you know, um, they don't like an authority that they trust enough to use something else. And so they use that and the civilization start to become prosperous. And as trade increases, become more and more inconvenient to use precious metal. And eventually they switch to some kind of fiat money. Um, and they do that and everything goes even better for a while because trade is even more convenient, even more, you know, um, even more stuff happen, the civilization grows, but eventually the authority that is in charge of the fiat money become untrustworthy and print a shit ton of it. And the value goes to zero and the civilization collapse, right? And this is what happened to the Roman Empire. This is what happened to the Ottoman Empire. This is what happened to pretty much all big empires through history. And so here you have this technology that have been something that every civilization during human history have been struggling with, right? So we are talking about some, some breakthrough that is very, very significant. That is maybe, you know, on the on the same level as the printing press or, you know, like this kind of technology that, that is going to transform the way civilization work like significantly and durably. And so when you start eroding those property, uh, you end up with something that is still valuable, but no, that's, um, that's kind of a cool widget. That's not the civilization changing technology that it is. Right. So the, the, the whole, um you know the whole possible impact of the technology is is orders of magnitude less and um and if if we like the question was with value so to look back with value if the potential is order of magnitude less the the value to be made is also orders of magnitude less um well let me let me go over over your your answer here so first of all mm -hmm. uh yeah, you shouldn't. If somebody is is inexperienced, you shouldn't be be going around uh, telling them what what their portfolio looks like or should look like. Uh, so that because that would be a kind of a, a conflict of interest there, yeah. I think. But um. Uh, but but yeah, uh, if you're talking to um. Someone who who recognizes that that he is he is at his own own risk, then then uh then then yeah it's good good to have a have a pitch and um and i think that what you what you said about potential upside is is good because i think that uh you you need to think think differently about something uh, about the the, po the possibility of something going down differently than the possibility of it going up and something something with a lot of potential upside is not necessarily something that you want to uh to to buy exclusively right it's something that you want to be you want to be open minded about so you you're ready to uh to benefit from that potential upside if if it should be realized but then yeah. uh you shouldn't you should also not not be open to um to 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 a a risk if if the potential upside is not realized so to me that is sort of uh the, exactly the there is a lot of upside but if you go all in you are taking a huge risk as well yeah, so that's kind of how I would would look at uh, Bitcoin Cash.
as well. So how did you come up with the the name? Because uh, you've you've got bit. Well, first of all, what 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 made you want to start with Bitcoin ABC? Because that was before Bitcoin Cash, right? Yeah, but uh, Bitcoin ABC was actually never meant to be, um, you know, to be a main client or whatever. Uh, before starting the whole stuff, I was making research on scaling solution and Bitcoin ABC was just um, a base software that I could build, you know, various stuff on top of it. So I could make experiment and measure and, you know, get a sense of how things work in practice. Um, and um, yeah, so so that was what it was, and that was not a project that was you know widely broadcast to word or advertised as you should use that in production. That was very much a research project. Um, when the whole USF movement started and the Segwit two X seems like it could be a bait and switch and all of that, um, that made me reassess what I was doing. I was like, there is there is a huge opportunity here, and nobody is seems to you know go in or at least not going fast enough. And so I was like, I have this project, which is um, you know very very strong base with a few experiment on top of it. So I just scrapped the experiment, um, implemented a few, a few change for Bitcoin Cash, and and released that. So that that's essentially how Bitcoin ABC happened. Uh, well, let's talk about UASF. Because um, mm -hmm. can you can you tell me about about that? Because that seemed uh, I don't even know what was going on then. <laughs> okay, so there were some people that wanted a technology called Segwit activity on Bitcoin, and some people that wanted bigger blocks. And there was a conflict between those two groups, and that uh, created kind of like a, a locked situation where nobody was getting anything. So the, the two sides were fairly unhappy about that. And at some point, people who wanted SegWit decided that they would run a modified version of the software that would activate SegWit on August 1, no matter what. And if they would get majority hash rate with them, then they would become the main chain. They would become Bitcoin. But if not, they would fork on their own chain, kind of like Bitcoin Cash did. And um, and so that was what USF was all about. And it, it got some support. And this is where the idea of Bitcoin Cash started, you know, appearing in various different cycles actually there is not like one person that i did it's kind of like several group of people that that made the same realization roughly at the same time it's like if those usf people they're willing to split the chain to have their stuff then we should be ready to have the other branch of the uh, you know if they if they are ready to split the chain and have what they want on their branch then we should be ready to have what we want on the other branch right and and several group of people started having the ID when when USF you know started taking steam. So so this is where the, the seeds that ended up creating Bitcoin Cash uh, appears. USF was actually quite uh, instrumental there. Oh, okay. Well, I'm sure that they would be happy to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so. But hey, hey guys. <laughs> well, um. Let's see if I have any. Uh... Okay, so I have some some questions here. Let me let me see. Oh man, uh, <laughs> I wasn't wasn't looking. Now there's quite a quite a quite a bunch of stuff here. Let's see. Is it on Twitter or in the chat? On or? on the YouTube uh, the YouTube um, live. Uh, okay. Link that I um that I that I showed you. Let's see. Oh, okay. So. <laughs> Have some uh, someone asking about your your hobbies. What what do you what do you like to do besides uh, creating uh, Bitcoin Cash? So yeah, I do a lot of programming. Um, I do also one of my hobby is uh, speed cubing. So it's like um, solving Rubik's cube very quickly. 
Oh, I yeah, I remember you were playing with that. Uh, yeah. So I used to, I used to be very, um, you know, very serious about this. I was doing competition and stuff. Uh, not as much this day, but I still do it. You know, this is, uh, this is a hobby. Um, yeah, I don't know. Video game as well. I play video games. Um, what do you? What are your favorite games? Uh, Starcraft Brood War probably. The, the oh yeah, okay. I've played, I've played Starcraft. Starcraft. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's um, uh, it's an like you know it's this kind of game like like um, maybe poker and chess would be in the same category where the rules are quite simple, but the game's like opens in in so many different ways, and and there is almost no upper limit in terms of skill where you can go. Right, you can always get better. Um, so to, to give you an idea, when I was, um, I, I'm not as good as I used to be. When, when I was, you know, uh, very good at it, uh, I, I, you know, I could, um, I could do very well online against most people, and but it, it's it's a bad metric. But I, I was doing roughly 120 action per minute. That means, like, you know, on average, two action per second. Oh my god! And um, <laughs> well, that should that should make people feel better about your your responsibilities. I think because that is <laughs> that is. Uh, I played I played through the the campaign of of StarCraft. I've I've never even gotten to the point where I can play against other other humans. That's sort of. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, so when you get to that kind of level, you cannot beat everybody, but you can, you know, on average, beat more people than people beat you online. But still, when you look at the pro player, they literally do three times more action than I could do during the game. And this is not all spam, right? This is um, this is actual action. So the the upside is um, is so far away. It's 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 very interesting. So uh, I guess uh, how how can people support uh, Bitcoin Cash uh, if if they're they're interested, um, other than buying buying some more? Yeah, so if they have some money, they can buy some. Uh, that's that's you know <laughs> that's increasing the value, so that's good. Uh, if they know to program, they can go to review.bitcoinabc.org and and they can you know code with us there. This is um, you know this is an open source software. So if you have an idea of of some cool stuff, then then go ahead. Uh, if they want to get involved into the, the protocol design and and future improvement that are going to be deployed, there is um, there is a schema that put in place. Uh, various work groups. So if they go in the Bitcoin Cash org um, organization on GitHub, uh, there are various repository in there, one for the website, one for the specification, and one for the work groups. And so the one for the work groups, there are going to be a bunch of links about work groups, about various aspects of the protocol and the consensus rule and all of that that people can go talk to. So that's for more technical people. People that are uh, less technical, then a good way to help is to um, talk to merchant mostly. If you have some Bitcoin Cash, um, you can spend it to merchant, and um, you know maybe they are not aware of it or whatever. So you can you know contact them and and tell them about it. Uh, tell them why it's good for them, not why it's good for you. <laughs> If, if you want that to be effective. Um, I don't know. Yeah, that's a good good set of stuff that people can do. Okay, well, um, is there anything that, that you want to talk about before we, we close? Um, I don't know. Um, yeah, so you talked about uh, the the Narnia stuff, and and you know all different people in Bitcoin would fit in that universe. Um, I'm I'm very interested by this kind of meta stories, like you know the pattern that reemerge within story, because I I think 
I think this tells us something profound, you know, about the, the human psychology. Uh, so this is a series of video that I liked very much. And about that, I would like to, so you said that the Bitcoin Cash people, they should be, they should be Sauron, right? Or they should be the, the grand villain in general. Yeah. And, and so I would like to ask you, you know, like what we are doing and on that front. Oh, well, let's see. That's a good question. Well, well, first of all, uh, have you, have you read the, the Narnia books? I haven't read the Narnia though. I read the, the, um, uh, what's the, the Lord of the Rings stuff, but not Narnia. Oh, okay. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, um, but well, the, the, the real point of Narnia specifically is cause it's kind of like a, a fan fiction universe and there's a lot of, a lot of weird uh, mind control uh, plot twists in it, so that's that's why I use that series. But but Lord Lord of the Rings is is kind of similar. It's it's just more that the uh, the the threat is is contained. It's sort of the the bad the bad guys are in Mordor, whereas in in Narnia is much more much more paranoid. You you don't know. Yeah, they are everywhere. Yeah. Can be anybody. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, okay, so um, well, how how are you doing on being being Sauron? <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I I'm sorry. I I will have to think about that and and get back to you. Um, okay, that's fine. But uh, I, I am I am excited to uh, to go to the the Satoshi Vision conference to to see how uh, how how that's going. But I but I do uh, I I think that just uh, it is it is good to know that my my message is uh, is being heard. <laughs> With my uh, the the specific video is called "Strategy in the Core Cash Conflict." <laughs> That's one of my my greatest creations. So glad to hear that uh, you're listening. <laughs> yep. Okay. Well, uh, it was great to talk to you, and um, who, and for anyone watching, remember that uh, everybody has their their own perspective, and I I really just ask you to to give me your perspective. So uh you you have to you have to go out and and keep learning to to come to your own opinion um and uh i'm going to to edit out the the beginning and ending and any like awkward pauses in between I would like, yeah i would like to make a quick parenthesis about what you said so this is indeed like as an investor this is the position that you want to take right you want to learn about various side and you want to place your bed accordingly and what i see a lot at least you know in what people express is that there are a lot of people that are invested in crypto that are angry about various projects bitcoin cash being one of the one that makes people angry but but also one as well um listen uh, if you are angry as an investor you're not doing it right you should be angry where you are in the pit fighting with other but as an investor you should be placing your bet on people and and so if you are angry about some coin in the space it's because you perceive it as a threat right and the right move as an investor there is to diversify yourself so that this stuff is not a threat anymore either by investing in it or by investing in other stuff that you think that if this if this thing is going to beat your main stuff then you know you need to be edged now I told him to be prepared for some very tough questions that he was going to have to defend Bitcoin Cash against, but uh, instead uh, he uh, he just did such a good job getting on my good side that I forgot to grill him, um, and I was uh, I really wish I had asked him about uh, replay protection, but um, well I'll uh, I'll see if I can get get what he thinks about that uh, later on. But to me, it seemed like he showed more interest in trying to be my friend than in actually convincing me that Bitcoin Cash is going to go up 
or that it has any value at all. And uh, <laughs> that is, well, that, that could mean that he understands me so well that he has he has he has watched all of my material very carefully and he knows how to how to fool me um but what i actually think is that he kind of thinks in a way that is is similar to me so he just kind of uh we we naturally have a uh a similar way of thinking but uh if if he is is just fooling me then uh it doesn't it still doesn't matter so much what's what's going on behind the scenes because uh, simply understanding me that well is going to give people an edge, I think. So, so there is that. Now, uh, you notice he did not try to uh, concern troll me at any point during this interview, and and that is definitely a trigger for me. Uh, I have I have programmed uh, the Emperor of Bitcoin character to uh, react uh, badly to concern trolling. So if you concern, if you say something that sounds like uh, I'm I'm worried about this and you should be too, then um, I try to say something that sounds like I am am making him more worried, and I'm acting not at all worried, and I also don't understand exactly what what he wants so it is kind of like um like i'm like i'm being intimidating and and playing dumb at the same time and uh his answers were kind of immune to concern trolling from from my end too see so he said he when i asked him why he started bitcoin cash he was just like well, I was trying to do my research with Bitcoin ABC, but uh, I saw the opportunity, so whatever. <laughs> so that's basically saying that uh, he, like, if the only reason you do something is you see the opportunity, that really means that you don't have to um, justify what what you're doing to anybody else. So if I had said something like, what about... Uh, mining centralization or whatever he would have just said well i saw the opportunity well, you see what i mean like there isn't any um there isn't any reason for him to give uh good answers to any other any 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 concern trolling questions after that see he seemed like he was uh willing to uh to answer whatever I wanted to ask about, and uh, uh, but uh, there was no there was no no reason for him to uh, take take concern trolling seriously, and he also did not attempt to indoctrinate me about his uh, hypothesis as to the value of Bitcoin. So you may recall when I asked him why people might want to invest in Bitcoin Cash or how how it might fit into their portfolio, he he answered the question uh, in terms of a hypothesis about Bitcoin's value, and he did not really attempt to see if i agreed with him about that hypothesis uh, and he did not attempt to uh get me to to go along with it so he said that the uh the core team was willing to see bitcoin's monetary properties be reduced um in order to satisfy some arbitrary definition of security what that means is there's a theory as to what makes Bitcoin valuable, and that theory is that it is based on the monetary properties of Bitcoin, not the definition of security that has been adopted by the Bitcoin core team. But he did not appear to need me to go along with this theory 
nor did he definitely appear to believe it himself. See, he said he saw an opportunity. Maybe the opportunity is create Bitcoin Cash and then sell some of the core coins for the cash coins, right? Or maybe the opportunity is make Bitcoin Cash and sell the cash coins for the core coins. That's seemingly less likely, but to to me it, it is he he is presenting presenting the value of bitcoin cash in terms of a a theory about bitcoin's value and the opportunity exists because somebody believes this theory uh not not necessarily me or or him okay and uh i think that is a good way of doing things because that is really leaving the decision up to me, the investor, which is where it should be. And if he was trying to... So when I, when I once said in public that I thought the Lightning Network probably wasn't going to work, and, uh, but I also wasn't, wasn't terribly uh, knowledgeable about it, I, I definitely got uh, some people on Twitter who uh, who who uh, strongly strongly needed me to believe in the Lightning Network. So that is um, that's kind of a, a bad sign if it, it seems like the the people surrounding an investment really need you, and it is kind of a good sign if the, the people don't seem to need you. Now, if you are at all familiar with StarCraft, you know that this is a game that can take up an arbitrary amount of brain matter to succeed in. And the only limit is the amount of brain matter on the other side, okay? Now, if Amari had said that his favorite game was uh, Dwarf Fortress, then I probably would have gone all in on Bitcoin Cash right there. Um, but StarCraft is, uh, that's, that's a very good choice. The only thing I don't like about StarCraft is Kerrigan. And to me, she is like someone who is trying very hard to appear formidable and, uh, failing and just making the Zerg a lot lamer with them. And she's really a lot like if Deanna Troy had uh, turned evil and taken over a planet or something, because you'd be like, well, it's still just Deanna Troy. Now, as to the question that I didn't answer in the interview from Amory, which was how is he doing being Sauron from Lord of the Rings? And that is a reference to an earlier episode of my show called Strategy in the Core Cash Conflict. So, he's watching my show. It seems like some important people might be watching my show. Maybe I am Emperor of Bitcoin, because he is asking me for feedback on how he's doing. Hmm. And uh, you should watch this, this video, The Strategy in the Core Cash Conflict, because I think in the future it will have a place among Bitcoin propaganda videos, similar to that of The Triumph of the Will by uh, Lini uh, Riefenstahl. And uh, so you'd better be familiar with and um, uh, I have thought about it, and here is my answer. There are two, two aspects to the character of Sauron. There is the, the subtle, uh, quiet, manipulative ring that, uh, that whispers into your mind, and you're never quite sure 
where your mind begins and where the ring ends. And then there is also the, uh, the uh, giant eye warlord, the giant army who is going to take over the world. And uh, I think that Bitcoin Cash is doing very well on the, the ring aspect of Sauron because it doesn't matter how how low in value Bitcoin Cash goes up up to a point because it is still going to to amplify the information from the old investors in Bitcoin see so it is going to provide feedback to uh, the, the Bitcoin core team that they would not be able to get otherwise it is in their best interest to pay a lot of attention to this price because that is going to uh, tell them how the the old investors are feeling about them now as to the warlord aspect of Sauron uh, I don't know how how well you're doing on that, but um, I guess if you if you are doing well on it, I would like that to be a surprise. 